everybody, and thank you everyone for being here. Hopefully you've enjoyed your lunch and you're ready to learn a little bit more about North Dakota personalized competency-based learning. We call it NDPCBL. It's a pretty big mouthful, but this um, fantastic panel is gonna be here to share with you today more about our learning journey. Before um, I get into that, I'll explain a bit that PCBL or NDPCBL is provided and supported by KnowledgeWorks. KnowledgeWorks is an outside foundation, a nonprofit, who came to the state of North Dakota for an opportunity for a multi-state, multi-partner approach to supporting schools and districts in an educational journey. This is a five-year commitment that without our partners at KnowledgeWorks, as well as the external partners they bring together, these fine folks, minus the Northern Cass Public School District, who wasn't able to be here with us today, and the Bush Foundation, who was able to bring funding to have this really gain momentum in North Dakota. All of those partners come together to really help these schools and districts on that trajectory of personalized learning. So thank you all for being here, and um, my first question is to you, Dr. Beth Bloody. What is PCBL to you in West Fargo? And that is a loaded question. We have spent the last year really as a team of 25-ish um, uh, administrators trying to determine what it actually is. Um, and what we've determined is it doesn't come in a box and what it is in West Fargo is very different than what it is in the other four districts. It is um, the support that we are getting is really helping us take the idea of um, personalizing learning based on our state standards and making it our own in our own district with our own resources. So it's adding voice and choice to our guaranteed and viable curriculum. We've identified our proficiency scales and our scope and sequence for the work and really what is tight in our curriculum to ensure that every child has equal access to the learning that they deserve and it's not based on the teacher they get, the school they attend, the neighborhood they live in. That we have pieces that ensure that every child is getting their right to that, that guaranteed and viable curriculum, but adding the voice and choice and the differentiation to allow students to explore their passions, to work at the levels that they are at and to achieve their highest dreams, regardless of the grade they've been assigned or the interventions that they need. So that's what it means to us. Uh, we also define what it didn't mean to us in West Fargo. It does not mean that a child's on a technology device for the majority of their day. It means that they are engaged with other students, participating in activities, and solving real life problems. So in our vision, there is noise, there's relationships, and there's um, collaboration and learning amongst the students. Thank you. Um, Dr. Heddletwit, can you tell us a bit about why you believe PCBL or NDPCBL was the right fit for your learning community? I think it was the right fit for our learning community, but it's also the right fit for education as a whole. Um, <clears throat> for, for us, we are the North Dakota Youth Correctional Center, and so we're known as Marmot Schools, and our students are coming from all the districts, right? And so beyond the why, it needs to be the what for. And so the students that are coming to us are coming to us on lots of varied stories, lots of varied pieces, as you described too, and they can't fit in the square peg. And so we need to make sure that we're meeting them where they're at to get them where they need to be. And that doesn't mean seat time. That doesn't mean any of those other pieces. It means that we individualize for them because they're individuals. And so with them not having this as their plan of the chapter that they're writing currently within our stay, um, it is our duty as educators serving young humans to be our community people that we meet them in this way. That is our why. So a unique factor with the PCBL journey is these districts identified a design team. Their design team consists of sometimes 30 members to 15 members, and local districts determined who were those right players on their design team. So I'd like for Oaks and New Rockford Cheyenne to share a little bit about their design team and the uniquenesses of it. Okay, our design team, um, I'm gonna consider Anne a big part of our design team. She is by far the best cheerleader we've had. 
She's there all, at all times, keeping us going and personalizing the journey for us as individual districts as well. Um, our design team consists of board members, the community, staff, students, parents, economic development, post-secondary, and new to our design team is our student engagement facilitator. Um, we're very excited about that position as well. And also we've worked very closely with the Lindsay School District out of California. Um, fabulous team that has been there to support us and guide us and give us a lot of direction. Our design team is similar to uh, New Rockford Cheyenne's. We also uh, have our special ed director as part of our design team and, and oftentimes we talk about that personalized competency based education is maybe like special ed except we're going to have an individual plan for every student, not just a student that uh, is, is on an IEP. Uh, we, al we also have representation from our local REA uh, and then from two post-secondary institutions. And, and I will note that the, the people that are on our district design team were not all strong supporters originally of this initiative. I'll give, give you an example. One of my design team members, um, about two years ago and, and three months before this initiative came out, I had posted a blog post that said, uh, as your superintendent, I can tell you that the next school year will not involve any massive changes. And then this came out. <laughs> and we did a, we voted on it as a staff and chose to do it. And uh, someone indicated that, you know, I, I knew it was too good to be true. Craig said, we're not going to change anything next year. And now we see this in the newspaper. Well, that same individual I asked to be on the design team because I need stakeholders that are both for and against to be able to spread the news and help us be transparent. Um, and that person has been great. Is actually working with me right now on publishing an article for our local paper on what we're going to do this year specifically. So that's been huge. It, not everyone's in favor, um, and sometimes those are the people that we need to make sure fully understand what it is that we're doing so that there's not misinformation floating out there. Okay, thanks. Our convening structure, the structure of this design element, is to bring the school districts together on a quarterly basis throughout the school year. And then in addition, they've received intensive supports in their local school communities over the summer. Many of the school districts have this as a volunteer option, parent or educators are not required to attend. I know right now there's over mm -hmm. 200 educators getting together in West Fargo to dive deeper into some elements that they've explored during personal or during the NDPC about PCBL work. My question to any of the design team members, what can you speak about your priorities that you've determined through this first year of visioning, and what are some of the actions that you're going to work towards as a learning community over the next year? I can jump in. Uh, so we do have 200 teachers being trained in depth of knowledge, for example, today, um, and other pieces of it, but we're really working towards at the secondary level, defining what we want students to know and be able to do, develop the levels of proficiencies that we are striving for, and to ve develop scope and sequence. Um, we have a standards-based report part card K-8, so much of that work is done for K-8, so we're really looking to explore um, the depth of knowledge and to push forward on um, adding voice and choice into our guaranteed and viable curriculum so that it's um, to allow for that flexibility and, and teaching teachers how to do that. Thanks. That's West Fargo. Penny, could you speak a little bit of your profile of a learner at Marmont High School? Sure. Um, in addition to that, I would piggyback that we are also taking a really deep dive into assessment because we have a finite length of mm -hmm. stay. And so we need to be able to really define both where they're coming from and what they know, but also the best way we can get them to where they can be for us before they take off back into their home district or wherever their next stay is going to be. And so our portrait of a graduate um, is still a work in process, and I think that that is probably the biggest message of this whole initiative, is that it's a living process. Um, our students change every year. Right, And so for us, we might get new students in every week and somebody on a new ro on one teacher's new roster every Monday. And so to know that that is the piece. So our, our graduate uh, portrait right now, I would say, is shaping up nicely, but will probably be a to be continued as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How about engagement? 
How does engagement work within the cohort structure? That could be engagement of your educators, engagement of your learners, or engagement of your community members. Does anyone want to speak about the engagement factor? I'll start. Um, our why started with our student engagement surveys. When we took a good hard look at them, we sadly found out many of our students are not engaged and they're not enjoying school. They're compliant, they're, they're, they're good kids, they're doing what, is, what they're supposed to do. However, they didn't find it as enjoyable and as a rewarding experience and, and didn't see the value in it that we hoped that they would see. So there started our why. Um, in addition to that, as this year, looking back on the year, which was, which was challenging at times, <laughs> is that a good word? Challenging at times because you just don't know where you're really going. I mean, these people have been fantastic laying out the framework for us and we fill it in and they're giving us the guidelines. This is what we need to do next. Then, you're, then we do this, then we do that. So we as, a, as New Rockford Cheyenne District continued throughout the year doing what we needed to do and this summer, we looked back on it and we thought, my gosh, where are we in the picture? I mean, we've been so student-centered that I guess we decided we, we have to look at what's best for our staff, too. And if our staff isn't feeling um, connected and engaged with us, as I'm one of the EDU fellows in our district, we aren't doing a very good job of taking the message back from our convenings back to our district. And this year, that is going to be a huge focus for us, the growth mindset amongst our staff, building the relationships amongst each other, and simply, as I told us in, in, from the Lindsay School District, have fun together. Have fun away from school together. And that's something in our district we've somewhat shied away from, and so we, we tend, we're planning on building those relationships as well as all that with our students, because if we can't start at the top, I mean, you have to start at the top. You can't start at the bottom with the students and expect all this to happen when we as adults aren't taking care of ourselves first. With engagement, one thing that I think is different for us, and it's even a struggle for me, you know, in my entire life of, of being an educator and going through the public system, I was used to being told what it is I need to do and then also being told, here's how you do it. Now just go and repeat that. And so when we're going through this process, um, they continually are telling us, we're not going to tell you what you need to do in your own district. It's going to be dependent upon what your learners' uh, needs are, what your community you know, you know, <coughs> wants. Uh, and so, for example, the last two days, we had professional development on learner agency and family engagement. And so the morning in, in involved uh, going through what that was, uh, what it entailed. The afternoons involved our staff coming up with ideas and plans on how they're going to implement that uh, and how they're engaged in uh, making this happen. And th that engagement piece is, is a struggle because they, we all, me too, said, just show me and then I'll repeat it. I, I don't want to have to come up with it myself, but I think when having us engaged in it, that's what we're hoping our teachers are going to do with our students in the classroom as well. And so we need to replicate it even though it's difficult. Thanks. I think that is something that we've all learned through this process. So often in education, we're trained on something. We purchase Read 180, and we're trained how to implement it and what tools to pull out at what times. And this journey has not been a training. This journey has been <coughs> a deep dive into what our communities want and need, what our learners want and need, what we believe is a vision for our school communities. So um, we've really spent this first year solidifying that vision and then activating how do we move this forward into practice within our schools and in our districts. A question that I would have to each of you or to any of you would be... <coughs> Make it a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, if you could dispel a myth or the myths of NDPCBL, what myths would you want to dispel? I have a laundry list, but I won't share them all today. But I think some of the myths are that once you don't have a framework, there's automatically some assumptions that credits are given and different things like that, right? And so I think one of the major myths that has to be debunked is that 
if we're meeting them where they're at to get them where they are, that might look different for each and every student, and, w and wouldn't it and shouldn't it, right? The same as if you're parenting or coaching or whatever you're doing, as educators, that should be one of the pieces. And so if we are able to create the assessment and the artifacts that show that this is what they know how to do, and I do it differently than they do it, and that she does it in their districts, that's okay. And so I think that is the biggest piece, and I think that will bring higher value no matter the student, and we won't have that fifth grader that had a positive piece but no connections as often. Thank you. Other myths? But one of them was already mentioned today about it's not simply students in front of a, a screen all day long, every day, uh, simply learning from that. I think that's... Um, a big myth that's out there, and, and, and a myth that we talk about in Oaks a lot because we're traditional, we've, and that's the, that's the community, um, is that this isn't necessarily something that's never been done before or never been seen before. I, I think it's a lot of different pieces of really quality education chunked together and say we should do these and these and these things. For example, when, when I talk to people about we're not going to simply have kids moved on based on time. We would have them base, move on based on uh, where their knowledge is and what they're competent in. So if a student is able to continue further and faster than the pace the teacher is teaching, we should give them that content. And I'll have someone say, well, Craig, my fifth grade teacher did that to me in 1975, and it was great. This isn't new. That's just quality education. Uh, and, and I think... I, I think there's been a lot of these pockets of excellence happening, and we're just trying to capitalize on, the, on those versus saying, we're starting something totally new out of the box and it's all our ideas because I've never had a new idea in my life. I've just stole them from <laughs> everywhere else and I plan to continue doing so. Teachers pay teachers at its finest, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that Craig kind of has mentioned is um, this has been potentially going on for a while and we see pockets of this succeeding. One of the things that this initiative or this learning journey also tr does is it aims to transform the capacity of the Department of Public Instruction and the Department of Education. Now, it doesn't mean that Ann Ellison will potentially have different hats and different roles, although I think it is a little bit of that. But what it also means is how are we changing the mindsets within the Department of Public Instruction? And how are we changing those structures and systems to allow for innovation to happen while still happening within the parameters of the Century Code and sometimes happening within those structures and systems that we're all familiar with, and MISO3, power school, local policies. So part of this learning journey is to also be able to use it as an incubator for student experiences and moving that forward, but also how do we inform policy changes and what needs to happen in policy in order to continue this to grow. And sometimes it's local policy. Sometimes there's not state statute in your way. So that's another element that we really um, have embraced through this learning journey. Last question for each of you to answer. As we've experienced year one of this five-year journey, I'll say again, what has been your biggest takeaway? What's your biggest champion um, through this first year? I would just say that there's not one way that this gets rolled out. And I, I really came into it, kept waiting for you to tell us what the next step was. And we spent the whole year, it was a struggle. It was a struggle, um, but that we are moving forward and that it can be scaled even with 11,000 students and it can each, um, even building, it can have different flavors but the pieces that are guaranteed, what we can feel great about knowing that our students are getting that engagement, they're getting opportunities to explore their passions, hopefully even exploring possible career outcomes, um, hopefully getting opportunities to engage with the community because we're taking down the walls that confine us from being able to do that. And it will take time, but it will get done. That's my takeaway. Great. Mm -hmm. I feel uh, beyond the why, and the discussion of the why was so rich, that the takeaway and probably one of the first rewards is that now we're starting to ask how. Um, but beyond that, I think one of the other takeaways is that 
blazing a trail, even though the trail's been blazed multiple times before, but now it's in a different way without the framework, um, it's also a good acknowledgement that that makes our educators vulnerable. And so we have to make it okay that some things are not going to work well, and we will learn first and we'll fix second as we begin the policy pieces and those, those things. So I think my takeaway was truly making the vulnerability safe. My takeaway is um, obviously it's time for a change in education. Our kids deserve it. Um, I think what we've been doing, it's, it's almost like you're creating a new lifestyle. It's challenging, it's a, it's a, it's a journey, but a journey well worth, I don't know if we're gonna complete it, but a journey well worth moving forward on. Um, the framework that we've been provided has been fantastic, and the guidance and the direction is great. We're not there yet, and that's okay, and we're all at different places, and I think we have to just be okay with that. It's, it, but it's definitely a wonderful journey. My takeaway, and it came just about a month ago at a conference in Rapid City, uh, is that I need to be able to encourage my staff to, to try some of these things and, and go and be willing and able to fail. Obviously, not fail over and over the same on the same thing, but not sit back and wait until we think we have all the answers and, and know everything and it's going to work perfect because we'll never get any movement in any, anything happening. And we have certain, I have certain staff members that are saying, come on, Craig, let's go. You've been talking about this for two years. How come we're not doing more? versus the other end of the staff that need more time and, and want to let that uh, the process play out where they're more comfortable. Um, so just the last two days at PD, I started with, I give you permission and expect you to fail. Uh, it's kind of like the Mario Andretti uh, comment that says, if, you're not, if you feel totally in control, you're probably not going fast enough. Mm -hmm. Well, again, thank you all panelists for being here. If you do have questions, feel free to contact me at the Department of Public Instruction as well as any of my other Team ND members. I also am inviting you to contact any of the members on the panel to learn more about the process, learn more about the uniquenesses happening within their schools and districts and how they're meeting those unique needs of students. But we look forward to sharing with you throughout our five-year journey and um, want to keep celebrating innovation that's happening in all ways, shapes, and forms across North Dakota. So thank you. Thank you.